of you listening, to those of you who are chasing their bliss, and to those who found it and are living it every day, it's Friday, January 26th, 2024, and this is Fortell's Fortune Told. I'm your host, Fortell. This is a show about music and musicians, songwriting and performing, and the stories of real people investing themselves into this art form because it's who they are. For today's thoughts, I want to remind everyone out there that I've been a software engineer for about 22 years, and I consider myself kind of a futurist thinker with tech. Um, I'm only so good with programming, but I've been doing it a long time, so I've really gotten uh, pretty good at it, as well as um, um, some people have said even better things than that about it, but it, it's one of those things where I spend a lot of time thinking about music, I spend a lot of time thinking about my family, I don't spend all of my time thinking about tech in everywhere you could go and everything you could learn, everything you could do at home or what have you. Uh, I do produce my own apps at home, and obviously I have the Fortel app, I have the defunct railroad app with the watch app accompanying uh, you can find on the Apple App Store. Um, but I, I feel like I've always been in tech for, so much for the last 22 years that I think you, I've been seeing trends, obviously, along the way of advancements in how things affect society and whatnot. And so today I wanted to talk a little bit about AI. And I want to put, start with a, a premise that we as a society will soon vote will vote in powers for AI to make decisions for our government. So it all starts with, first of all, the advancement of artificial intelligence and, of course, the imperfect nature of humankind. Both of those, the humankind thing's been there forever, but the advancement is finally there. And obviously, it's continuing to advance. And so as it goes along, I do believe all of this will begin with sports. Yeah, not big tech or Tesla cars or anything. I'm talking about sports in general. And this, this is due to the rise of gambling on sports, really, and the sheer amount of money shifting hands, depending on how games turn out officially. So I don't know if anybody in the audience knows about sports gambling, but you can bet on all kinds of outcomes and scenarios and players and wins and losses. And there's points given to or taken away, depending on who's favored and whatnot. And people throw money around doing this all the time. What's really interesting about gambling, I find, is they now get you to gamble, but not only on one thing to see if it hits, but they, they convince you that you can do two or three things. And if they all hit, you win so much more money. It's hard enough to just get one thing to hit, let alone two in a row or three in the same thing. So they've really got you going there. But nonetheless, there's a lot, a lot of money, depending on how a game turns out officially. Major League Baseball players have fought strike zone calls for as long as there's been baseball. It seems that refs and umps have their own version, and they say this is the, this is the strike zone for the umpires. And it's up for the players to shift, depending on what that gentleman is thinking. The NFL refing this year, as all years, is surprisingly atrocious. It's one of those things where the NFL prides in itself on being a game of inches. And these people spend so much time, effort, hours away from their families to become better athletes and better coaches and better administrators and all that stuff, marketers and scouts and everything. And if there's something on the field that's called, like say there's a, a fumble, um, it's a big game changer or say an interception or maybe, um, you know, um, gosh, I don't know, uh, a dropped pass or something. Those are things that happen. Athletes don't always, you know, make the right things and that's con considered a mistake if you fumble the ball or what have you well those are big game changing plays well some of those plays by refs that are called takeaway touchdowns can be like 60 yard game like changers of momentum which 
Those things are huge game changers. And if they're wrong, they're huge mistakes. I can think of example upon example of bad calls with video evidence to overturn it, but the rules of the NFL and whatnot aren't allowed to overturn it. Amazing. So what's actually happening on the field isn't really what's being called. Again, think of all that money getting changed, changed hands. The NBA has had past scandals exposed in which refs were fixing games for years. That's on Netflix somewhere or some other uh, streaming service. Offsides in hockey is often debated with tech assistants. And gosh, boxing through the years has been scandalous. So there's a lot of room for improvement and people are going to get mad. Maybe not mad enough to change right away, but soon this will be getting exposed. People are going to lose enough money over bad calls that, um, and in fact, why would things be changing now? I actually see some things changing in this realm. For, in fact, Major League Baseball has instituted an AI strike zone in the minors. And all signs are it's coming to the majors. Repeat, an artificial intelligence strike zone is coming to Major League Baseball. I would argue that the NFL has the ability to t today, if not soon from now, um, as they have already a lot of cameras and they would need a lot of cameras for this, but to watch a play in real time, say mo on a monitor with all the players and they all have green squares on them. And then the play starts and as their actions go and it, they, those actions run against algorithms and maybe they're on the verge of doing something illegal, it seems like. And so that player square turns yellow. And then, of course, if a player committed a penalty, his square is now red. So if someone's monitoring that, it would be very simple to capture any play. Um, so the play, all penalties can be caught, and no non-penalties can be called. This could happen, but it probably won't happen. See why the control of money and the power, that's why. So as this changes in sports, this most likely will go well if implemented. People will be much happier and see that the games are called more accurately, causing less fighting and stress amongst about the game and, and if the game is rigged. And then we will see as a society and remember all the lies, the mistrusts, the statements of not voting and then voting or voting on something that they said they never would. And then all the politicians, what they have done and what they're doing, what they've done forever. And we're already sick of it. So there's a solution. If there's a solution and we can trust it, why not eliminate the human nature factor at all and see what happens? So this may start as a candidate for president running on a platform in which they say, I will use AI to make decisions. Then over time, we'll see that the AI is doing everything and the human is really just the marketing and the face behind it and one day it's going to run alone uh, for president so this then precludes that one day humans will be running against ai for president to go back to the old days I probably don't have to worry about seeing this in my lifetime, but I do believe in our kids' lifetime, these are the kinds of discussions that AI is going to force. And those are my thoughts of the day.
light songwriting. Today, I want to talk about something that's very important in the realm of performing live, and that's sound. Yes, the sound system, the equipment, talk a little bit about some of that stuff, but overall I want to talk about just how you would approach doing sound for yourself or for a band or for a specific artist. So first of all, I think you need to think about the mood and you know the energy the artist wants to present and that is presenting. Um, also then the tone and nature of the venue and the room itself. Um, the shape of the room, the space that you're in, what's behind you, where you're projecting from, where outputs would be for um, speakers and sound versus where your inputs for your microphones, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, you need to know where power is in your space. Um, I think the rhythm and the feel of the music that you're projecting is influenced by the sound, or and the sound is influenced by that. So you, those should match. Um, when you get down into the actual mixing of your sound, there are various effects you can use. There's reverb, delay, chorus. All these are very um, traditional electronic ways of manipulating sounds with effects using electronics and are now digitized. Um, But you can pan certain elements, certain speakers, uh, say your guitar pan left, your piano pan right, or something like that, or vocals or what have you. Um, guitars themselves, many, many guitar players use pedals. Um, a lot of acoustic guitar players don't, including myself. And uh, there's reasons for that, but many, many people, guitar players have a pedal board, where, and that can be a number of three to five pedals. I've also seen pedal boards that had like 30 or 40 pedal. It was more like a pedal box or a square board, a rectangle, a plywood, I don't know. Um, but all of them had various different ways to manipulate the sound of the guitar, and you could add them together or what have you. And so really the answer for you on all of this is, you know, what's your sound? Are you electric? Are you acoustic? Um, are, is your sound going to change throughout the night? Do you play different styles throughout the night? Are you going to change instruments, etc.? cetera? Are you gonna have different people come up? So my, after doing this for a long time, I've been hosting open mic for over seven years and I've been performing music my whole life, but for seven years as a professional. And um, I, this is my answer. I get a lot of compliments and people even wanna buy my sound system for some reason, which I wouldn't sell because then what would I have? I'd have to buy a new one, which would just be this, so. Um, but so the amount of, this is what I've learned. The amount of effect, and I use reverb, uh, depends on the space. I generally, for, I almost, um, never even use reverb in a small space. I want, because this is the deal. You want warm, clean, full spectrum sound in which the lyrics of the vocalist can be completely understood. So all that together, warm, it's gotta feel good, it's gotta feel good. Clean, not dirty, it's gotta be a good feeling. Full spectrum, from the low end, the middle to the high. Representational, non-distorted, clean representation of the sound in which the lyrics of the vocalist can be completely understood. Now, this is really important. I have had a lot of interaction from fans saying that my sets, my stuff, the music I play is exceptional somewhat times just for that very reason that they could hear all the lyrics and they could understand what they were singing. There's a lot of musicians out there that do not recognize that what they're singing is not understood and the people then don't care or don't like it as much. So 
you must be able to sing and enunciate so that people can understand, folks. So yeah, I, I could give you the details of my actual sound setup if you'd like. Just hit me up at foretellmusic.com and I'd be glad to share. Public Dreams, Part 1. So back in 2017, um, actually, if you know my story, I started becoming a professional musician kind of in the middle of 2016, but didn't really start making money at it until 2017. And right then, about halfway through that year, I decided, you know, I see a lot of people having albums. <laughs> this whole, the whole LP to C CD and cassettes to on and on and on to digital to now streaming. That is a topic that I want to dive into on this podcast, but I will not do that today. But that is something that is a can of worms. Wow, let me tell you. Um, and not a great transition for us musicians, let me tell you. Um, and Neil saw that coming. Um, and so did David Bowie, actually. But anyway, I sorry, I digress. Um, I noticed that people had LPs in the, or al albums or EPs or what have you, short plays even, um, but they were promoting them and selling them. Even CDs were selling and some people are selling LPs. Um, if nothing else, they were putting things out there on Spotify and stuff like that. So I'm like, okay, I've got some songs. Um, I got to think about that. So as I'm playing along that year, I get the pleasure of um, meeting and playing with Al Laughlin from the Samples fame of the 90s. And Al has a new band called Highway 50, which is a ska reggae band and um, is an amazing, amazing local band here and um, in the Denver area, um, out of Niwak, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado. Um, Chris Wright is the amazing bass player on that. And I met Chris and played with him a few times, once at the Dickens Opera House with the Highway 50 and then another time at the Alamosa Grill in Denver. Um, and he was telling me that he had this recording studio in Boulder called the Violet, Violet Recording Studio, Violet Studios. And I uh, eventually uh, worked my way in and we got an agreement and we did it. Um, so I, I recorded uh, my stuff. I had Chris essentially fill in a lot of the other stuff that I didn't play and my buddy Denny Driscoll, who I also had interviewed on a previous podcast, uh, played bass and sang on the song that I've got featured today, in fact. Um, so Chris was absolutely amazing. He is the most amazing uh, musicians, sound guys you'll, you'll ever meet. I don't know him too personally, but he seems like just a tremendous human as well. But his bass playing is just tremendous, and you'll hear him on this cut. Um, he also plays the, the full drum set on this cut. Um, and by the way, he also recorded everything in, at Violet for us and mixed it down um, in a very uh, professional way through you know very expensive vintage equipment um, that's been proven over and over to be the standard. And uh, so shout out to you guys. Um, love to have you on the podcast, by the way. And uh, it's just a great output, and I was so happy with it. And um, that definitely helped me establish myself. But it was, a, I got to say, I was a little bit too early on in my resurgence as a musician and just my development as like a singer and as a guitar player. Um, I also play trumpet on this as other songs as well. Um, and, but considering where I am now, I feel like this recording as well as those on Public Dreams Part 1 are a little bit um, not as mature as where I am right now as a musician. And so I, I feel like maybe I hit the scene a little bit before I should by doing this, but it's something that I really wanted to do and it established some relationships that I still have and I really, um, I'm really happy to have. Um, as we go through life, it's nice to have, you know, good people that you know. And uh, 
uh, good friends. And the the uh, the name Public Dreams is a reference to my guy Joseph Campbell. Um, I'm, he's the Follow Your Bliss fame. Um, he inspired so many folks, including um, George Lucas, to write Star Wars, as well as has done a, the deepest dive into mythology on the planet that I've ever um, heard or discovered. There's definitely others, but he's he's probably the first that I knew about. He's got a great lecture series out there and the power of myth, et cetera. Um, there's lots of um, great interviews and stuff like that. But he, um, Joseph said, uh, dreams are private myths and myths are public dreams. That brings us to the end of this episode of Foretells Fortune Told. I want to thank you so very much, as I certainly appreciate y'all listening today. And feel free to interact more at foretellmusic.com. But for now, I'll send you into the sunset with my song, I Know She's Out There. And I hope your journey is as expected. She's out there Somewhere being beautiful Somewhere being perfect In that imperfect way Floating through the universe She's painting it with love She's painting it with feelings In her heartfelt way And I'll meet her someday Something